All right. Awesome. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. We are looking at a passage today of, uh, it's a famous passage. It's the 12 spies who are in the wilderness that go into the promised land and they uh, go kind of scout it out. They get, they get a chance to taste the promise that God has um, before everybody else in Israel does. They get to scout it out. Now, I love this passage. I just want to let you know, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. In fact, before I even went through this series in the book of Numbers, um, I think the only sermon I had actually preached in the book of Numbers was this passage to the young adults, you know. Didn't, didn't really touch any of the, the rest of the book of Numbers. Um, and I just love this story. Um, how many of you are familiar with this story? Really cool story uh, about Joshua and Caleb, who are uh, two of the 12 spies that go into the promised land, and they're the young guys, and they're like, God's called us to this place. We can do it. And all the other 10 spies are are grumpy and pessimistic, and they're like, but there's giants and everything. And like, just like in my early years of life and early years of ministry, this was kind of a passage that like, I love to rally around, right? Like you see, uh, it's kind of like, a, you know, you'd come in just believing that God's going to do anything, and you have people that maybe are doubting or they've been through a lot of life uh, seasons, and so they're just like, they've experienced a lot of things, and they're maybe a little pessimistic, and I love Joshua and Caleb, that they've kind of been like, no, God can do any- anything, and I love that childlike faith. So this passage is, uh, it's really awesome. I love preaching it. Um, I kind of looked at it this week, though, with uh, a fresh pair of eyes. I just want to say, Lord, you got kind of a different message, and there's, I'm telling you, there's a lot of different angles to look at this passage. So we're definitely going to hit a different angle, and what's cool about this is we're, we've been doing a chapter each week on the book of Numbers. Next week is also, uh, it's like part two to the story of the spies. And so this story goes over two chapters. So we're going to definitely look at different angles of the story, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, today, we're going to actually focus on an angle and look at this story through the lens of leadership, okay? And uh, talk about, you know, different attributes of leadership areas that the leadership in this passage maybe fell short. And so if you're, if you're a leader in this church or you're a leader in your own ministry or if you're a leader at your work or you're a leader in any capacity, this will be really relevant. But I'm just going to tell you, even if you're not a leader, these, these values and these principles go beyond leadership. Uh, the thing is, they just, uh, they're, ex- they're extremely applicable to leadership because when you're in leadership, everything gets accentuated by the way. So your strengths are accentuated, but when you're in leadership, also your weaknesses are accentuated. And everybody sees them, right? And it impacts everyone. And so we're really going to take this uh, with the the angle of leadership, but it's going to be really applicable to everybody. Also, this sermon, I'm just going to let you know how many of you like to take notes. Okay, we've got some note takers in the room. We got, this will be your typical three-point sermon this week, all right? So uh, for those who like the, the three points kind of thing, this is going to be your week. This is my, my birthday gift to you, okay? This week I had a birthday. Uh, so um, normally I'm, I, you know, I'm kind of like uh, the, the whole like, oh, I'm going to tell a, a really funny story, get everybody's attention, and then do three points, and then end it with the story, and kind of like, you know, I'm like, uh, you know, but I understand it's like, you know, American culture likes that, but I like to branch off on different communication styles, but today we are going to do the three-point sermon, so you guys can already number your three points on your piece of paper, all right? Um, So let's get into this. Would you guys stand for the reading of God's Word? Numbers chapter 13. All right. And I'm going to do us a favor, and I'm going to skip verses 4 to 15. That just lists off the names of the spies that are going in the wilderness, so, but we'll read the rest. All right, this is the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of each leader. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran, All of them were leaders of Israelites. Verse 17, let's skip to there. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev 
and onto the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live there are strong, weak, or there's, a, there's few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good? Is it bad? What kind of towers do they li- or towns do they live in? Uh, are they unwalled or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile? Is it poor? Are there trees? Are there not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob towards Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where Ahiman and Shishai and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived there. Hebron had been built seven years before Zon in Egypt. When they reached the, uh, the valley of Eskol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eskol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran, and there they reported to them and the whole dis- assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified there. And the Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up uh, with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report of of the land they explored. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. All right. My sermon title today is I Spy. You can have a seat. I Spy. You can write that on the top of your notes. I spy. That's the title I gave for this sermon. Um, Have you guys ever read the book, I Spy? Um, I just started doing these books with my daughter, by the way, my my different, my daughters. Um, We actually got into it. um, Actually, I just got the book, I Spy, this week. Sam bought it for my birthday, so I could do it with my daughters. Um, But before that, I was doing a book called Where's Waldo with my girls. Okay, have you, have you ever heard of the book, Where's Waldo? Okay, so, um, you know, I, as I was reading a book one night to my, my girls, I noticed they were pointing out all the little different things in the book, like, oh, do you see a jaguar in the bushes there? And I was like, maybe they would like Where's Waldo, you know? I grew up reading Where's Waldo. If you don't know what Where's Waldo is, uh, so I ordered it off Amazon. Where's Waldo is a book where there's like, you know, hundreds of people on the page, little tiny people, and hidden amongst the people is Waldo and his friends, okay? And so you have to, like, look around for Waldo. There's Waldo, there's Wenda, which is, I say say to the girls, that's Waldo's girlfriend. I don't really know. They could be in a committed relationship and married. I don't know. Uh, So we got Waldo, Wenda. Uh, There's a a wizard with a, a staff. There's, there's a, like a reverse Waldo. He's like yellow and black stripes. Uh, his name's Oddlaw, which is just the funniest thing to watch kids try to say Oddlaw, you know. Um, and then there's Woof, who's a dog, and uh, he, it's just his tail sticking out of things. So it's always the hardest thing to find, right? So we've been, we've been going through these books, and they've just been having so much fun with these books. And uh, so when we finish a book, and we do well, I've ordered another one. There's like seven Where's Waldo books, We're almost done with them, so that's why we moved on to I Spy. I Spy is the same way, except it's like the book says, I spy a thimble, and you have to look on the page for the thimble, right? So it's just a little bit different. Um, But what I've realized is as I've bought these books, they get harder and harder. Like, I don't know if the people who made the first ones were like, made it really easy, and then they're they're like, oh, we need to make this hard. Like, it gets to a point where I'm like, I can't find Waldo. I'm going to throw this book across the the room, right? Like, it gets gets pretty hard. but 
it's funny because I've had kind of these like epiphanies as we've been going through these books every night. Um, there's a lot of principles that you can learn from these books that really parallel our normal everyday life. Like one of them, I would say, is you tend to find what you're looking for. And the same thing goes with life. You tend to find the things in life that you're looking for. So if I say, I'm going to find God's goodness, I'm going to find the way that God's working in my life, and, you, and you're, you're intentionally looking for that, you tend to find it. But if you look for things, uh, maybe uh, ways that you think God hasn't been faithful in your life, you will tend to find those things as well. It's so funny because when I sit and I do Where's Waldo, I have to keep Evie on focus, my daughter Evie, because she's always finding things that aren't, you're not supposed to find in the books. Like she's like, guys, I found a clown on the page. I'm like, Evie, we're not looking for a clown. We're looking for Waldo, you know? And Eliana's like, oh, I found the clown. And before long, they're looking for things that they're not even supposed to be looking for. I'm like, we can't turn the page until we find Waldo. Help me find Waldo here, right? Um, but such is it in, in life. What we look at and what we set our gaze to, that's the narrative that we're going to say in our hearts. And so uh, the same thing happened in the Garden of Eden, right? God said, you can have from any tree in the garden, but don't eat from this one tree. And what tree could Adam and Eve not stop and help setting their gaze to? The tree they're not supposed to. They had the entire garden at their disposal, but the one tree drew their attention because it's the thing that they were looking for. It's the thing they were focused on. And it's funny because, um, you know, I, f I feel like, Almost like the books get harder and harder and harder of Where's Waldo. So when you're following God in your life, when, you're, when Jesus is your Lord and he's leading you, it seems like different seasons of your life, it gets harder and harder sometimes to find the goodness of God. But we still need to find it and trust that his goodness is in our everyday life, that he is faithful, that he is working. We need to set our gaze to what God is doing. So, but check this out. I want to compare what Moses says here and then, or what God says to Moses and then what Moses says to the 12 spies. Look at this passage. So verse two, God says this, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites from each ancestral, uh, uh, ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Look what God says. God says, all he says is, Send them into the promised land, and this is the land that I'm what? I'm giving you. God says, I have given you the land. Go explore it. Notice what Moses tells the people. He does not tell them the same response. He says this. He goes, see what the land's like, whether the people are strong, weak, few, many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled? Are they fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best, or do your best to bring back some of the, the best fruit of the land. So look, God just says, go into the land, and he tells them what to look for. He says, I've given you this land. Moses then tells the spies to go into the land, and he tells them, look at these things, look at these things, look at these things, look at these things. He's telling them to look at things that have nothing to do with what God said. And they get distracted along the way. Now, this, this is maybe a part of uh, Christianity that maybe butts heads with our culture. Because in American culture, in our court systems, we have this uh, kind of saying, innocent until proven what? Guilty, right? Right? So, which is great. I love our legal system. I'm thankful for that. Not everybody's legal system is that way, by the way. Sometimes you're guilty until proven innocent, and that's terrifying. Um, but in the legal system, you start off innocent, and you have to find the clues to prove somebody guilty, right? Faith is not that way. Faith does not work that way. Faith does not work with, like, uh, the absence of God's goodness, and then you're looking for goodness. It starts with truth, and works its way backwards. Because God has already given the verdict of truth. He's already given, uh, and so what faith does is faith takes God's truth and it looks and says, what can I, where do I find God's faithfulness proving the truth 
of what his word says. It works opposite than what we're used to. And so it is our job as believers to take the truth of God and look with eyes attuned to what God uh, has said. So when his word says, you are more than conquerors, I'm not looking for ways that I'm defeated. I'm looking for ways that I'm a conqueror in Christ. I'm looking for ways that he's already made a way, that he's already defeated the enemy. Or when it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, I'm not going around looking at different things I can't do. I'm looking at what God called me to do, and I'm saying, wherever he guides, he's going to provide, because he's God. And so when his word says, death has lost its sting, when I'm at a funeral and somebody who has been following the Lord has lost their life, I'm not, I'm not at the funeral saying, this is goodbye for them. I'm saying, I'm see, I'll see you later. Because I've taken the truth of what God says, and I'm not looking at what I see to prove my faith. I'm walking by faith, not by sight. Can I get an amen from someone? This is so core and foundational to our, our whole entire belief system, is that we start with the truth of God, and we work our way backwards. This is what it means to be people of faith. And sometimes what you see might not line up with initially what he said, that doesn't mean what he said is not true. My daughter Eliana is notorious for wanting to turn the page and give up. And right when she wants to give up, boom, she finds Woof's tail sticking out of somewhere. All right? It's on the page. I'm telling you, God is faithful. He's good. He has not given up on you. It's still on the page. Don't leave the page of faith Trust that you're going to find his goodness. This is what that passage, by the way, Psalm uh, 27, 13, we love this passage. Uh, It says, uh, I think that's three, but 13 says, uh, you guys know this, I'll remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land that I'm living, right? And too often we take that passage and we, uh, I think we apply it to, I'm going to wait on God because I'm going to remain confident. I'm going to see his goodness. But I think it can also apply to, you know what, I am going to see the goodness of the Lord. My eyes are going to be attentive to the goodness of the Lord. I will see them in the land that I'm living. Meaning, I'm not going to get to the end of this life and miss God. I'm going to find him. I'm going to look for him. My eyes are going to be set on him. And my focus is going to be on him. Amen. This is important because we are supposed to set our gaze on Jesus. We are supposed to set our eyes on his truth and on his word. We are supposed to set our eyes with a, a hopeful gaze, as the Bible de- describes it, as eyes with hope. Or uh, you can think of it a biblical optimist, optimacy. Is that a word? Optimacy? I would say biblically optimistic, all right? You need to look with your eyes, to trust that God is faithful and good. Now, too often when we, talked about, we talk about that word optimism, right? Which is, you know, somebody who sees positively, who sees the best, who sees good things. Um, too often, I think, as a culture, we rope optimism into kind of like a personality trait. We just say, oh, that person's an optimist, you know? Um, that person is uh, hoping for the best... Uh, They're optimists. I'm going to use the board here, okay? I'm going to just put opt so I don't spell one of these words wrong and then it's on the board for the rest of the sermon, okay? Optimists, all right? And so you have some people, which, by the way, to be hopeful, I'm just going to use these words as synonyms with each other, to be hopeful or biblically optimistic, trusting the Lord It takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of intentionality. You have to know the word. You have to trust the word. It's not something that just people people naturally have the word on your heart. You have to put the word on your heart. You need to know his word. Too often we have people that come with this disposition of a hopeful optimism, and then you have other people who sit on the other end of the spectrum. What would we call them? It's funny because you ask somebody different, everybody says something different, right? You have pessimism. But some people would actually, maybe the pessimists in the room would actually say realist, right? Like, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. And then we try to put optimism and realism on uh, different ends of the spectrum, which, to be honest, they don't belong on the same spectrum, okay? There's optimism, and then there's pessimism. Realism is on its own spectrum, 
all right? You have realism and I would say non-realism, okay? So listen, you can be an optimist and be a realist at the same time. A realist is just somebody who doesn't deny the reality of things, okay? So this is where I see Caleb, by the way, in this passage. He goes into the promised land, and he says, there's giants in the promised land. He's not saying there's not giants, but he's like, you know what? God said we could take them. So we can take them. And I would say this is what biblical hope, hope looks like. Biblical hope. Some people have an optimism, by the way, that's not centered in realism. They would be like somebody who went into the promised land and, and they're like, but there's giants in there. And they're like, no, there's not. I didn't see any giants. God's, God promised us this land. We're, we're going to be fine. There's no giants in this land. And while I feel like, yes, the hope is there, the problem is you're leading people to an unreal expectation. And then when they meet giants, the people are going to, they're going to freak out. And so I would say this is not an example of biblical hope. Now, pessimists can be realists too. They can say, oh, there's giants in the land, right? We can't take the giants. But it's pessimistic. Normally, yes, you wouldn't be able to take the giants, but God has given you the land. So I don't know how he's going to do it. That's just not true. So you have this uh, bibl- or pessimistic realist, and, and honestly, you do have pessimism non-realism. You actually see it in the text, too, where uh, the, the spies come back, right, and they're like, the ground, the whole land eats up anybody who lives there. You, did you see him when he said that? He's like, the ground consumes. What are you talking about? That's not even real. No, there's, how are the giants living in the land then? The ground does not swallow people. It's not uninhabitable. People are living in this land, right? And so you have, you have three different ways that kind of go against this. What biblical hope looks like what a, a leaning into hope looks like is not denying the hardships or the realities, but it's pressing into it and believing what God said about it. And that's what God is calling every single person in this room. Any kind of uh, disposition we have that does not lean into biblical hope is, is not aligned with the word of God. We are called as a people of hope. Every single aspect of the kingdom of God, we need to step in with faith. Faith, it says in the Bible, is the substance of things hoped for. So you literally cannot have faith without the foundation of hope. Hope is incredibly important. Hope is needed. Imagine if I came to the cross with pessimism. And, uh, yeah, Jesus died on the cross. I don't know if it's going to cover me or not. I mean, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Does this sound like believing in your heart that God was raised from the dead for your sake? No. We can't have that, we have to have the position of hope in our hearts. This is why, and this, honestly, this applies to every kind of kingdom principle. It applies to uh, evangelism, sharing your faith with people. I'll tell you what, the people that lead other people to faith, to Jesus, I almost always find this disposition in them where they're just hopeful and optimistic. God wants my brother to know him. I can see, and then they're looking and they're seeing fruit. Did you see that? He brought up God today. Did you see? And and they're just, they bring this kind of spirit of expecting God's gonna work. But when you go and you're like, well, they may or may not know Jesus, I don't know. I would say 100% of the time, I've never seen people turn to the Lord like that. It takes faith, It takes prayer, it takes perseverance, it takes uh, encouragement, and all of that stems from a place of hope. Hope is incredibly important in our faith. Hope is the fuel that takes us places in the kingdom of God. You you following me? So, verse 2, we we get, God says this, send some some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites, From each ancestral tribe, send one of each leader. So he says this. He says, send them to the land which I'm giving them. It's theirs. That's what God said. So when God says, you have the land, go get the land. Right? 
Go get it. But the problem here is not just experiencing some type of pessimism in the camp. It's not like there's some Israelites in the camp that are experiencing pessimism. The problem is you have a leader that's experiencing pessimism. And when you have negativity and pessimism coming from a leadership level, it's toxic to an entire team. It's toxic to an entire culture. Because as, as a leader, get this, you guys aren't going to believe this. This is going to blow your mind. As a leader, your job is to lead. Okay? <laughs> Meaning, you have to go there first, and they will follow. So as a leader, the primary job is to inspire, it's to encourage, it's to hope, it's to trust, it's to come to a place that's saying, God called us to this, we're going to do it. You have to ignite the people around you. And if the leadership is not leading, it's just like, Ugh, right? I don't know, I just made that up now. <laughs> Did not, that was not as good as I thought. You know, some things you're like, man, that was the spirit. And some things you're just like, I don't know, still got a little bit of a cold or something. Okay, so if we had to boil these down, here's your, here's your first point, by the way. As a leader or anyone else, you must always lead with hope. It, it's just got to be, it's part of the job. It's, it's part of the role. It's, it's, you have to come with the disposition of trusting God, with igniting faith, of calling us to something better and greater. So let's look what, what, uh, again at what Moses says, verse 18 to 20. I'm going to bounce back and forth with these, by the way, quite a bit. See what the land's like, whether the people who live there are strong, weak, few, many. What kind of land do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. Okay, so do you see what Moses does here? God says, I've given you the land. Go explore it. Moses is like, check this, check this. Make sure that's okay. This, you got to look there. Make sure the land is good. Make sure this. My question is, why? What's the point of that, Moses? Oh, wisdom, you know? Just want to be prepared, right? Moses has sent people into the wilderness, and he has them looking at all the things that don't even matter. Why don't they matter? Because God said you had the land. God said it's yours. And so here's what happens to Moses. When you look at the text, it's so interesting. When you compare Moses's, uh, his little speech to the Israelites and then God's speech to Moses, Moses's speech is like three times longer. Did you notice that? He's just going into so much detail. And this is another problem, by the way. Moses overwhelms the people that are following him by these details, and they forget the main picture. They forget the main reason that they're going to the, the wilderness, they, or to the promised land. They forgot. God said, you have the promised land, because they got bogged down with all these details. Now, here's the thing we need to understand about details in general. Okay? Details are a great thing. Details accentuate the vision. Details accentuate the vision. Details are like, have you guys ever uh, watched the TV show MasterChef? Okay, and okay, it's like it's a cooking show with Gordon Ramsay, and uh, you know, you learn a lot from that because people are cooking their meals right, but then they also need to have the presentation right, right? So people are like decorating their plate and stuff. The details are like decorating your plate. But I'm telling you, the details are not the main thing. If you decorate a plate so nicely, but you forget to put the steak on your plate, you're going to get an F, right? Because the details, the details are supposed to accentuate, but they're not supposed to overtake. They're not supposed to become the main thing. It's like a beautiful plant that you, you plant in your garden that's supposed to accentuate the things in your garden. 
But what happens is if you don't take care of it, if you don't keep it in its place, it'll consume it and you don't know what the main essence of the garden is anymore. In the same way, we need to be very careful with the details. Now, there's a lot of people in this room that probably consider yourself detail-oriented, all right? I raise your hand if you're detail-oriented. I'm not putting you on blast here, okay? It's a beautiful thing, actually. We need detail-oriented people because they actually uh, accentuate things and make things, like I said, they make things uh, better. But we need to understand and remember the place of details and not get bogged down with them. It can be a sin to let the details overtake the main thing and become the main thing. This is what Jesus was correcting, by the way, all the time with the Pharisees. You remember? I could cite a thousand different passages, I feel like. Let's take the example when Jesus came to the Pharisees. The Pharisees had this tradition, they called it ceremonial washing, where they would wash themselves before the meal, right? And they did this, and it was, it, it, it was supposed to accentuate things, right? Because they would pray, they would bless the meal, they would do this, they would ceremonially make themselves clean as a symbol. And it, it was this beautiful thing that they would do. But the problem is, it became the thing for them. And Jesus and his disciples roll up to a meal, and they forgot to do the ceremonial washing. And the, the Pharisees tried to get at Jesus and said, how dare your disciples not do the ceremonial washing? And Jesus is like, how dare you treat your mother like that? I saw you. You're forsaking, uh, your, you're forsaking God's principles for your man-made principles. And what happens is uh, we need to be careful because those kinds of things, they have their own kind of like shimmer and their, their, their charm to them. If we're not careful, they become the main thing. So when we worship here at church, what we're doing in worship is not as important as who we're worshiping. So it's nice when we have an electric guitar on stage. It's nice when we play the organ one week. It's nice when we do this, when we do that. But that's not the main thing. It's supposed to accentuate the main thing. It doesn't matter how we do communion at church. It just matters what we're doing and where our hearts are like. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter how you dress when you come to church. What matters is, uh, are you coming to church prepared? Okay? And so you have one person that maybe they want a suit and tie, and that helps them get in the spirit of, I'm coming here to listen to the Lord. Praise God. Some of, uh, uh, you know, millennials might be putting on their skinny jeans, their best skinny jeans, you know, walking in here. Like, I'm ready to hear from the Lord. What matters most is the heart. This is the problem, by the way, what happened with Mary and Martha in the New Testament. Okay? Mary and Martha found out Jesus was coming to their house. Which, by the way, if, Jesus, if you knew Jesus was going to come to your house and visit, we would all have the same reaction. Let's get the house in order, right? Like we want to host him well. It makes sense. That, that's great. And have you ever been to a house where they've like hosted you really well? Like the house is really clean. There's like little cute sugar cubes next stacked in a pyramid next to the coffee and all these things. It's nice. I like going to houses that are like that too. But at the same time, that's not the main thing. And when Jesus actually came to the house, Mary was sitting at her feet and Martha's still in the kitchen cleaning. And Martha's like, Jesus, tell Mar Mary I need to get this house ready. And Jesus is like, basically, why do you want to get the house ready? To host Jesus. While well, I'm here, you're going to miss me by focusing on the details. You see what I'm saying? So often what happens is the main thing kind of gets blurred in the background. And usually it starts out great. It starts out with a good heart, but we just need to make sure that we keep the heart in the right place. This is incredibly important when it comes to leadership as well. Because you can take your, your team, you can take your organization, you can take your people off track of what's most important by focusing in too much on the details. Now notice, God doesn't give them much details. He says this, send the man to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving the Israelites from each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders, okay? He doesn't care as much about all these little things that we do. When I came to this church, the church came together, came up with this vision that we were to genuinely love our community, nurture new life in Christ. That's what God was calling us to do. That's what God's still calling us to do. Notice, though, that the vision did not entail how to do that. 
It didn't say, we're going to do this by doing ESL, or we're going to do this by knocking on people's doors and doing door-to-door evangelism, right? Like for us, the strategy we, we stepped into was we, we uh, renovated the brick house, did after-school ministries, renovated the, the playground, so we have a lot of the playground coming there. We, uh, we started doing missionary pathway, uh, pipeline pathway, I can't remember which one, you, you switched the word on me, so um, training, and, and so everybody can be a missionary exactly where we're at. So we did this, but we could have gone a thousand other different directions with it. I, I remember at one time I was thinking, maybe we should turn the pocket park into a splash pad. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Like, uh, like it would be the closest splash pad in the area. We'd have the kids using it all the time. Like, we had all these different ideas. And ultimately, God didn't say, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. He's, he's just like, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And there's too many workers right now that are at Lowe's picking their uh, shovels and their, their tools, and they're not on the battlefield doing what they're supposed to do. So don't get bogged up he's in the details. Focus on the why. And this is the second point I have. Never forget, you must never forget the why. See what I mean? It's, it, this is incredibly important for leaders because it, it bleeds into everywhere. But it's also important for us as individuals. We need to always be going back to, why am I doing this? What's my why? I think if we started asking that question more, we'd realize we're doing a lot of things in our life that once had purpose, but now they don't really have purpose anymore. It'd actually probably help us narrow down things in our life. Things we're doing with really no purpose, no why. It's important for us to keep reminding ourselves our why. This is why, by the way, um, one of the things as a pastor, you've probably heard me say this before, um, I've made it my intention that I'm never going to look up the numbers of how many people attend the church. The only time I do that is when we have to send our yearly reports and then they need me to put uh, the numbers in. And so then, then I ask, usually admin, what's our yearly average or whatever, and we put it in there. But I don't check on the numbers because I know myself that if I start focusing in on something like that, that becomes the main thing. And if that becomes the main thing and not making disciples in this place and not reaching the lost, if it just becomes being this cool place, we could do that. We could make this place trendy. We could, we could, uh, it's so easy to get off track. You might say, well, the numbers aren't bad things. We want people to be at church, right? But it can, it's so, it's crazy. You can do things with the right spirit and easily get off track. Um, just being even vulnerable with you. When I was at um, Fellowship Missionary, um, the way I kind of stepped into ministry, the first year I was there, I stepped in on the worship team. And uh, I got to play electric guitar on the worship team. And um, what was really cool is, um, you know, I had a, uh, this really cool flying V guitar. I was in, like, rock and metal bands in high school. And so, like, um, like I would, like, rip guitar solos in the middle of worship music. And it was, like, super fun. And I remember, you know, the worship leader at the time was like, that's pretty awesome. Uh, you know what we should do? For Christmas Eve, you should play the Carol of the Bells, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, you know, right, with your flying V. And so I remember I did that with one Christmas, and I was like, that was awesome. That really drove the spirit, and then we could really celebrate Christmas. And so we started doing that every year, by the way. They're like, Jordan, you're going to do the guitar solo this year? Yeah. And we just try to make it more and more every single year. And so I think it was like five years in, the Christmas Eve service, we got it to this place where I was playing the guitar solo, and we were on the, like, the round, so the, the seatings were around the stage. And we had like a, a giant uh, Christmas present box that was around the stage. And as we're playing, there's smoke coming out, and the, the, uh, the Christmas present was going to the sides. And, and I was like, this is awesome, right? And it wasn't actually until like a year later, I was looking at YouTube videos, and I stumbled across this, and I just felt this pit in my stomach. Like, wait, what happened? How did it get this way? Like, it's turned from worship to a show. And I realized what happened is we started focusing in on the wrong things. And then Christmas wasn't even about Christ. It's about a guitar solo here, right? Kind of gave a check in my, and, and, and after that, I stopped playing the guitar solo every year. I just would decline the request, or I just felt uncomfortable about it. 
Like there's something in my spirit, I'm like, I just can't do it anymore. It's so easy to forget the why when we get focused in on these details because the details can look really nice. Now, these first two points I had, I said, you must not forget the why. You guys remember the first one? You must always lead with hope, right? Both of these points, one thing that can help us to get our hearts right would be to focus on the fruit. Did you notice in the passage what happened? When they went into the promised land, they did see all these things. They saw giants. They saw all these. But what did they bring into the, prom, into the, the wilderness? They brought grapes, pomegranates, fruits. They said the land is flowing with milk and honey. Uh, let's look at the passage, by the way. It's verse 23. It says this. It says, When they reached the valley of a skull, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and some figs. Now look what happens, though, a couple verses later. It says, They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us. It does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified. They're very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. Go back one verse for me. One way that we can keep our hearts right, that we can encourage our hearts, that we can remain hopeful, that we can focus on the right thing, is if we focus on the fruit. I almost made the sermon title, by the way, Focus on the Fruit. It almost sounds like focus on the family, right? It's kind of nice and trendy. Focus on the fruit. When you have fruit in your life, when God does something in your life, it's incredibly important to take that momentum, to scream it from the rooftops, to remind yourself over and over again, look what God did. Set the fruit in the middle of your table. Set it, set it on your uh, countertop. When you wake up in the morning, declare the fruit that God has done. When you, you wake up, we had, we, you know, uh, this, is, this is a daily practice in everything you do. God, thank you so much that I got sleep tonight. Thank you, God, so much I didn't feel anxiety today. Thank you, God, so much that, I, that I, I didn't even think about this thing. Thank you so much, God. What is the fruit in your life? When you think about the fruit, when you focus on the fruit, when you focus on not, not the things that are uh, going wrong, but you focus on where has God been faithful and you remind yourself on it, it keeps you on track. It keeps you focused. Now, the problem is with this passage Let's, let's go uh, forward to verse 28. So it says, uh, you know, we, it says there is fruit in the land. It is flowing with milk and honey. And it says, but the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We saw giants there. Now, this is such a subtle thing, by the way. But, but notice what side of the butt is the fruit. They put it on the beginning. There was fruit and honey. There was, there, was, uh, there was pomegranates. There was all these things. But there was also giants. If we put the fruit on the other side of the butt, okay, let me say it like this, because you guys are just, y'all are focusing in on me saying the word butt here. If you put the fruit ahead of the butt, you'll be a butthead. Come on. There we go. Got it out there. It belongs at the end. Yes, there's giants in this land, but there's also fruit. Yes, I've been struggling for a while, but I'm also this. Yes, I've been going through this trial, but I know at the end of it is this. It's looking at things with a different perspective. And too often we have to ask ourselves, what side of the butt did we put our fruit? Come on. I... I got to say, so this last week was my birthday. I turned 34. 34 felt way different than like 31, 32, 33. 34 is like close to mid-30s. So you're like, ugh, right? And, um, but you know what? I would say this is one of the best birthdays I've ever had. And I got to tell you, we didn't travel anywhere. We didn't do anything crazy. My wife did, she stuck little sticky notes around the house, giving me 34 different things that I, like, um, you know, you're smart, you're this, you know, it's, it was really cute and stuff. 
But like ultimately, it was one of the best birthdays I had because I, had, I, I took such an intentionality where I thanked the Lord for the 34 years he's given me. Like, I, I went to lunch by myself, and I sat there, and I just reflected on these 34 years of life, and I just said, God, thank you so much. It's amazing that I've lived 34 years, that I'm as healthy as I have. And every year you give me is a breath, God, every, or is a gift. Every breath you've given me is, is a gift, God. And I had this, like, gratefulness, and I came to the end of the day, and I was like, man, God has been so good to me. And I, I even thought about, like, all these different paths I could have taken in life, right? We always think about that, like, well, if I would have done this, I would have went to this school. And, but I just thought, you know what? Like, what matters the most is that Jesus walks this life with me, that he's been with me. It doesn't really even matter which path I took. It's that he's with me. And I, I had this spirit of gratefulness. And I got to tell you, I got to the end of the day. My wife, it was so funny. I was talking to her in the bed, and I was just like, I was just like, man, I'm so thankful for the life the Lord's given me. And she's like, man, you are so sappy today. Like, she's like, you know, she's like, what is, what is up with you today? And I was like, I've just been grateful today, you know. It can change your life. And this is what I'm saying, because we're all looking for a way out of our wilderness right now. That's what the series is about. But let me tell you, the way out of the wilderness is always through the path of thanksgiving. Like, it's just going to, I'm not saying, oh, if I start being thankful, I'm going to get out of the wilderness. But it, the, the path out of the wilderness is aligned with the, the path of thanksgiving. Because there's actually two wildernesses you're going through at the, right now. There's the external wilderness that you're struggling through, and there's an internal wilderness, too. We don't talk about the internal wilderness. We just talk about the external one. We just want out of the external one, and we don't want to deal with the internal one. But I'm telling you, If you are freed from the internal wilderness, and that's through the gates of thanksgiving, that's from focusing on the fruit, that's from seeing God. If you free yourself in there, it doesn't matter what the external wilderness will do. You're going to feel free. Have you ever been through a life situation that's been so hard and so difficult, and you're just like, I know this would mess most people up, but I have this peace about it. Like, this is so weird. I feel this inner, like, like, That is the peace of the Lord. That is because you have entered his gates through thanksgiving and you have released yourself from the internal wilderness. In this world, you will have troubles, but take heart, it says, I've overcome the world. We can take heart that no matter where we're at, we we serve a God that is good, that is a God of victory and freedom. And so one of the, the best things we can do is free our hearts from the wilderness that we're in. So as I read this passage, I wonder what would have happened if Moses just would have relayed God's actual words and not gone into all that detail. And I, and I was sitting with this passage and I was like, trying to think from Moses' perspective, why would Moses do this? Why would he give them all these details and do all this? And I was thinking, it could be fear. Maybe there is fear. Like, maybe even though he's been seeing God, like, That last chapter we read, it said that Moses saw God face to face, which is wild. He says everybody else sees God through riddles and prophecy and all these things, but Moses saw him like face to face, which is amazing. So I'm like, maybe it's not fear. And I wondered, it's hard to know his heart unless the word tells us, but I wonder if for some reason it was out of a spirit of control a little bit. Now the spirit of control can come through many different paths. You could be having a spirit of control through pride. Like, I know what's best. I know how to do things. Maybe that's what Moses was doing. Maybe he's like, I've led this, these people, I need to tell them what to do. Or maybe it was through worry. You know, like, I'm just worried they're going to make a mistake or, or do something wrong. Or, you know, maybe it's a lack of faith. I don't know. But the details that Moses gives, whether he realize it, realizes it or not, it actually micromanages Israel. It tells them, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. When you go in the land, do this. Grab some fruit on the way out. Make sure you look at the land. Make sure you do this. He's a leader that's trying to put his hands in everything. Now, here's the thing. God did not send Moses to be a spy in the wilderness. He said, send 12, one from each tribe. We could read the list. Um, You can read it on your own. I'm probably not going to read it just because of time. Verse 4 to 15, it lists all these different people. 
God did not send Moses in the wilderness. He sent other people in the wilderness. So Moses' job was not to, to get on the ground. If God would have wanted him on the ground, he would have put him on the ground. So as a leader, and this is my third point, you must empower and let go. We talked about this a couple months ago when Pastor Hope was here when we talked about the handoff. But I really just felt like the Lord was just showing me again, this is an incredible point to understand. We need to understand this as a church. We need to understand this in our families. We need to understand this in our relationships. We can't control everything. It's not about one person. It's not about one vision. It's about his vision. It's, it's kind of like this here. I'll, uh, I'll put this on the... We'll use the whiteboard today, okay? As Moses is the leader, and he's given the vision from God, it's like a giant arrow, right? That's an ugly arrow. Sorry, it looks like more like a mushroom. Um, as, as people are within the vision, Moses' job as the leader is to just make sure that their arrows are pointing in the different direction or in the same direction. And if they are, his job is to empower them. People are going to do things in a way that you wouldn't do them as a leader. This is what's it's incredibly important in a church actually too is that God is speaking to everybody in different ways in different unique ways. They've he's he's given you vision that he hasn't given me. And as a leader, my job is to say what is God calling you to? If it's aligned a little bit off, we need to get corrected a little bit, but you need to run with what God's called you to. We are better when everybody is listening to the voice of God and following the vision that he has for him. And the problem with Moses is he is just trying to get everybody exactly in this line. Exactly what he's called to do. But he didn't give a thousand different Moses is in the camp. He gave 12 different tribes, 12 different people. And it's incredibly important we understand God has called you to something in this church. God has called you to something in your family. As as parents, we're not called to make our kids exactly like us. We're called to see what has God put in them and how do that I steer them in the way of the Lord. That's it. I mean, too often, I mean, there's, there's so many kids that grow up with hurt because they're like, I just couldn't meet my expectations with my dad. I just didn't like sports like my dad. I, I felt like I liked music more. Or I, I just felt like I couldn't fit in with my mom. Or um, I, I like to do this more. Or like, whatever it is, instead of calling, letting people step into what God has called them to do, we try to micromanage everything, and it will choke out organizations, it will choke out families, it will choke out friends, it will choke out communities. It's kind of like, um, I don't do cooking much at home. I did a lot of cooking when I was a young adult. I don't think it was really good. My wife does a lot of cooking. But I used to make, um, I used to love making brownies. Anybody else like brownies? Okay. I've really tried to cut them out in my life because um, it was just really bad. But what happens is, um, the other thing is, I'm not naturally patient, just in general, okay? And so, like, when I make brownies, I'm like, how soon can I get these out of the oven? Like, I'm like, I want them a little gooey. That's okay. Like, so I do the whole toothpick trick, right? You take the toothpick, you stick it in the brownie, and if there's still brownie on the toothpick, it's not done yet, right? Usually by the time I'm done with the brownies, it's looking like the face of the moon, Like, it's just like, like, because I'm like constantly, every minute, is it ready? Is it ready? No. Oh, maybe I'll try it over here. No. No. And I poke it so much that it just becomes unrecognizable, which if I would just leave it alone and wait until the timer's up, I would have my brownies exactly how I'd need them. This is what it's like to be a leader that micromanages. Every few seconds, so are you doing this right? Are you doing this right? Are you doing this right? What you're left with is a disaster of a brownie. Now, the part where the analogy breaks down is I'll still eat that brownie. It's still, it's still a good brownie, right? But it destroys things. A good leader knows you don't have to have your hands in everything. You don't need to put your hands, you don't need to dictate how everybody does things. You need to empower, you need to coach, and you need to step back. 
And that's how trust gets built. That's how um, strong organizations get built. Not based off one person, but based off teams of people. So let's look at these three points here. You got your three points in your sermon. Called to lead with hope. Never forget the why. And empower and let go. Let's do some time of reflection here. Would you bow your head? And let's reflect on this real quick. Lord, search our hearts. Holy Spirit, know our ways. I pray you pull things out of our hearts. This is definitely not a comprehensive list of leadership here. But there are some things that we can learn in this passage that we can grow from. Is, what is your natural disposition to things God's doing? Is it hopeful? Is it pessimistic? Do you have faith? Do you trust the Lord for big things? Do you encourage others? Or are you the one that's constantly doubting here? Let's think about that second thing. The why. Have you forgotten the why? The why you got married. The why you started having kids. The why you started serving. The why you moved to Fort Wayne. The why of the place you work. The why you give 10%. The why you host people. The why you do things. It's important for us to remember. The last thing, do you feel yourself trying to control people and things around you instead of letting go and trusting God? Really, these all go back down to faith, but what would letting go look like for you? Why is it so scary? So Lord, as we think about these things, I think about myself in these as well. I think about areas of my life where the why has disappeared. And I think about areas of my life where I've become more doubtful, more pessimistic. I repent from that in front of you, Lord. God, we just, we want to be made more like you. And I pray for those in here that are going to begin to take steps in laying things down in their hearts, step into what you have for them. God, we pray that that First Missionary Church would be a house of people that are leading well, that are empowering others, that are hopeful, and that we're moving forward with a strong understanding of our why. We thank you, Lord, for the lessons that we get to learn in this word. We thank you that these people made mistakes, and so we can look at their mistakes and, and correct for our hearts, to take them as warnings, to take them as, um, yeah, God, I just pray uh, this would mark us and change us. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.